the Fourier transform and the discrete time Fourier transform have quite a few different properties. We're just going to look at a few of the more important ones that we'll be using more often. And you can refer to a Signals and Systems book or even to our uh, textbook if you'd like to know more of them. And, and certainly they'll come up over the course of the semester. So the first one I want to look at is the so-called convolution multiplication property. And this property has physical meaning because we know that if we have a linear time invariant system, that the output is related to the input via a convolution of the input with the impulse response. So if we write y of t equals x of t convolved with h of t, which can be expressed in terms of the convolution integral, it turns out the Fourier transform, recall, is particularly simple. What we see is that the Fourier transform of the output, y of omega, is equal to the product of the Fourier transform of the input, x of omega, times the Fourier transform of the impulse response, which we're also calling the frequency response, of the system. The same property holds in the discrete time case, and that is if I have an input x of n to a linear system with an impulse response h of n, the output y of n, then the discrete time Fourier transform of the output y of e to the j omega becomes equal to x of e to the j omega times h of e to the j omega. We can see this pictorially if we sketch out some Fourier transforms here. Let's, we're going to do, this is going to apply to either case, so I'm going to put both of these symbols here, and I'm not going to put uh, independent variables in my graphs, but if I have some x, That looks like like that. So this is a function of either omega or omega. Then when I multiply that by the say the frequency response of the system, and we'll make a particularly simple h here. Let's suppose that it's just that. Um, then the convolution on the input side becomes multiplication on the output side. So I just have to multiply h by x, and I get why. This gives rise to the notion of filtering, okay? because a filter is just something that separates things. Now you have a coffee filter, it separates uh, the water from the coffee grounds, and here this would be called, this particular H would be called a low pass filter because it's passing the low frequency components of X and it's attenuating the high frequency components of X. So this multiplication property for linear time invariant systems is particularly useful because it allows us to rapidly visualize what the system is doing to the input signal. Now another property that's particularly useful is the so-called multiplication convolution property or it's sometimes referred to as windowing. And here we're going to define a signal z of t which is the product of x of t and some window w of t, or in discrete time, z of n is x of n times w of n. If I sketch this out, it's like I have some signal which x of t, which goes on uh, indefinitely, and what I'm going to do is only consider some finite time interval of this signal, say that represented by this window w of t, so then I'm going to analyze the signal z of t, which just represents the then I'm only looking at z of t in this interval. Well, the property here is the dual of what we just looked at. A minute ago, we looked at multiplication in the time domain, transforms to convolution in the frequency domain. Here, we see that multiplication in the time domain transforms to convolution in the frequency domain. So z of omega, the Fourier transform of z of t, is going to be 1 over 2 pi times x of omega convolved with w of omega. And in the discrete time Fourier transform case, z of e to the j omega is equal to 1 over 2 pi, the convolution of x of e to the j omega with w of e to the j omega. Now the reason I put a circle around this convolution symbol is because in the discrete time case, remember these functions
these Fourier, discrete Fourier, time Fourier transforms are 2 pi periodic. So this convolution ends up being only over a 2 pi interval. So I can write this out for you. It's 1 over 2 pi integral, say, minus pi to pi of x of e to the j nu times w of e to the j omega minus nu d nu. Okay, so rather than integrate from minus to infinity, we only integrate over a 2 pi interval. So in this case, say we've got x of omega, and maybe it looks something like this. And we're going to convolve that with the Fourier transform of the window. So it looks something like that. And remember, when you convolve with a sinc function, uh, you end up blurring uh, the edges of the original signal and introducing ripple. So I'm going to represent this qualitatively as follows. And I'll, let's put the 2 pi up here for completeness. We'll just divide, assume that this graph is w of omega divided by 2 pi, and this then would be z of omega. So the, from a practical standpoint, we can never evaluate signals from minus infinity to infinity with a computer or in our lifetimes, right? So we're always looking at some limited duration for a signal, and this tells us something about what's going on in the frequency domain. Well, the next property I'd like to look at is the so-called time shift property. And this asks what happens when we delay a signal or advance it in time by some uh, duration t naught. So if I have x of t here and I delay it by some t naught, in this graph I'm showing t naught as a positive quantity, then the Fourier transform y of omega is just e to the minus j omega t naught times x of omega. So if I delay in time, I multiply in the frequency domain by a complex, by a linear phase term. Okay, this is a complex number and it has unit magnitude and the phase is negative omega t naught and so that's linear in a function of omega because its slope is minus t naught. Similarly, in the discrete time case, I end up with y of e to the j omega is just e to the minus j omega n naught times x of e to the j omega. So again, we're going to have a, this is a complex number, its magnitude is 1, and its phase is minus omega n naught. So the slope of this phase as a function of frequency is minus n naught. So let's try to sketch something out here. If I have the magnitude of x of omega, suppose it looks something like that. We'll draw a phase, and I'll use the arg arg notation to denote the phase. Then when I delay this signal, my Fourier transform y, the magnitude is not changed at all, right? Because when we have the product of complex numbers, we just multiply the magnitudes and add the phases, and what you see is the magnitude is 1 here, so the magnitude of y is the same as the magnitude of x. But what has happened is the phase has been shifted. So if we write the phase of y of omega here, phase now has this linear factor. For example, let's take an audio. If I play a song right now, and then I wait 10 minutes and play that song again, it's going to sound the same. And this linear phase shift does not affect our perception of the sound. It only affects our observation of when things began. Linear phase shifts are generally uh, assumed to be relatively benign in terms of the kind of distortions that one can do with the signal. The final property I want to review in this particular mini-lecture is looking at if I have a periodic signal, which would have a Fourier series representation, how can I describe that in terms of a Fourier transform? And this is very useful when we're trying to analyze mixtures of periodic and non-periodic signals, because I can do that in the frequency domain using a Fourier transform. So let's suppose that x of t is a periodic signal, has a fundamental period, capital T. Then x of t is a Fourier series, x of k coefficients given by 1 over t integral 0 to t x of t e to the minus jk omega naught t dt. 
and the fundamental frequency omega naught is just 2 pi over t. The Fourier transform can be expressed then in terms of the Fourier series coefficients. And in particular, the Fourier transform of this periodic signal can be written as 2 pi times the sum from k equals minus infinity to infinity of the Fourier series coefficient xk times an impulse delta of omega minus k omega naught. Okay, so if I have a signal which is periodic in time, its Fourier transform is going to consist of a series of regularly spaced impulses whose amplitudes or strengths are given by 2 pi times x of k. We can do an example of a signal, periodic signal, that we're going to be using a lot when we study sampling. So let's call this S of t, and this will be just a train of impulses spaced by some interval, say, capital T. So it's minus t, 0, t, 2t, and so on. I can write this down in equation form as saying that s of t is equal to the sum l equals minus infinity to infinity of delta of t minus l times cap t. So to find that this is a periodic signal, and therefore it has a Fourier series representation, to find the Fourier transform of this signal, we're first going to find the Fourier series coefficients. And once we do that, our work will be pretty much done. So the Fourier series coefficients, s of k, can be written as 1 over t, that's the period, capital T. And instead of integrating from 0 to t, uh, we're going to integrate symmetrically about the origin here so that we get an impulse in the interval rather than worrying about half of an impulse or something like that. So uh, remember, you can always choose the interval you integrate over to make the problem simpler, and you should do that. So we've got the integral from minus t over 2 to t over 2, and in that interval, our signal s of t is just delta of t times e to the minus j k 2 pi over cap t little t dt. And if you do this integral using the properties of the impulse, this becomes 1 over t times 1, which is just 1 over t, of course. So at this point, we substitute in to our formula here for the Fourier transform of a periodic signal to conclude that s of omega, if we want to write this in terms of a Fourier transform, it's going to be 2 pi times the sum k equals minus infinity to infinity of 1 over t delta of omega minus k 2 pi over t. And so interestingly, this is one of those signals whose Fourier transform is the same shape as the original signal. In the time domain, we have a train of impulses. They each have strength 1, and they're spaced by cap t. In the frequency domain, we also have a train of impulses. Their strength is 2 pi over cap t, and they're spaced by 2 pi over t. So the spacing in the frequency domain is the inverse of that in the time domain. So this is an example of going between the different Fourier representations, and that is we've looked at how we can use a Fourier transform to represent a periodic signal which relates the Fourier transform of the Fourier series. We're going to look at other cases of this, especially as we get into the sampling. We look at how we use a Fourier transform to represent discrete time signals and so on.